the award from, from ITE Group, so you saw the, the case study there. But um, so the way that I think we'll get started here, I want each of you to have a chance to talk a little bit about uh, your organization, your company, or your organization. Um, and the question I'll ask as you do that is, with respect to financial inclusion and financial wellness, what is our responsibility as an industry? Um, how is it good for business to address these issues? And you know, talking about this Pierre Omidyar video I shared, can we do this in a profitable way? You know, doing well by doing good, that kind of idea. So um, why don't we talk, start with Justin, maybe tell a little about yourself and, and Air Fox and uh, this idea of kind of corporate responsibility and doing well by doing good. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so my name is Justin Hoffman. I'm the Executive Vice President at Airfox. Um, I essentially help run strategy, analytics, um, and growth. And uh, I was born and raised in the Bay Area, went to school at UC Berkeley, worked in investment banking after college, and now I'm at my fourth uh, high growth startup. So I'm, I'm very much a Silicon Valley guy. Um, and so, you know, the way that uh, I, I think one, one thing you've illustrated kind of with the introduction was essentially that there are a variety of disproportionate effects um, to being poor when it comes to being underserved in financial services. Um, I think a lot of it's very intuitive, right? There's a lot of off the grid uh, sort of um, resourcing for financial services that have naturally regressive fee structures. Um, you know, for example, like if, if here in the US, when you dip into your overdraft, you get slapped with a 25 or $35 fee even if you dipped into it by five bucks. So um, in Brazil, for example, there's also a lot of unintuitive and kind of predatory um, sort of uh, structures when it comes to lending, for example. So um, in, in Brazil, they have uh, overdraft as well, but uh, it's not as apparent with regards to the flat fees that we see here in the US. You, you learn quite quickly that you, you should be very cautious of using your overdraft. But in Brazil, you, you, have, uh, you have essentially 350% interest rates on overdraft and it's very appealing because you don't necessarily see the fees right off the bat. Um, also, in Brazil, they, uh, it's very common to pay for goods uh, on an installment basis. So, um, you know, you check out, you can, you can pay in installments, and it's uh, very alluring because now you can buy, you know, a new television and only, you know, for, let's say, 2000 um, bucks, but you're only paying 50 bucks a month. Well, we all know the math behind that, right? When you're paying a lot of installment payments, uh, with interest over time, you're sometimes paying two or three x the total price by the time you're done paying that loan. Uh, but it's not immediately, uh, you know, transparent to the consumer at the time. Um, so, so, so by and large, you know, um, you know, not to mention also the the invisible cost to being poor when it comes to, uh, you know, also if you're cash based or you're in the informal economy, um, you're taking time off work to go pay your bills effectively, right? So, um, because you have to go to physical institutions to to, you know, perform bill pay. Um, so, so I think when, when, I, when I kind of ask myself uh, what is the responsibility of, of our industry, I think it's, it's effectively to disrupt the status quo as quickly as possible. And so how do you, how do you go about doing that? Um, because, you know, on, on, on one hand, it's very easy to build a predatory business, right? It's very easy to, to uh, take advantage of people that, you know, need help the most. And so uh, it's really hard to build a business that actually creates a lot of consumer value while also being able to do so in a financially sustainable manner as a business. So I think, I think it really comes down to building an incredible you know, suite of products if you're a uh, consumer-facing uh, kind of business, um, you know, creating an incredible user ex experience that's very seamless, um, and also to push, push the envelope uh, when it comes to innovating on the technological front and the business model front to eliminate unnecessary fees and policies that uh, was, would uh, kind of restrict accessibility to, to services. So, um, I think at the end of the day, you know, we're really talking about the basics here, we're t at least when it comes to our business. With basic access to a savings account, basic access to viewing and paying your bills, um, basic access to credit. And so um, for us, you know, it, it ultimately just comes down to creating an incredible set of products um, that increases accessibility to core financial services. And, and it's good business, right? You can create a win-win yeah. scenario. That's the right way to go. But it's very difficult. So, so is... Um Air Fox is there's a business model around Air Fox where you're making money, right? This is a exactly. this is not a charity. Mm -hmm. This is a business, right? Okay. Yep. Um, so I'll jump around a little bit. I want to go to Armando. Uh, you give us a little background on on uh, your company and your thoughts around this corporate responsibility issue and and uh, how you're profitably serving needs of of underbanked uh, people. Thank you. Uh, in Qualix, we started. Um, uh, providing credit to the underserved and the uh, lowest cent on the, of the market. 
and we uh, we learned that all these uh, uh, potential consumers have a, a great challenge for not having a bank account and not having uh, access to what we call high-end services on a, on a low-end uh, fee basis, uh, kind of uh, what Justin just mentioned. So, so what we have been working on is is building a platform that is that is based on on on, on creating uh, on providing and, and having access, providing access to all the consumers to to the ability to transact in the market with having a, a bank account. So we don't provide actually the bank account, but we provide uh, through a credit account. We provide all the services, all the financial services that they can get, and we have developed uh, a platform that is uh, that is uh, able and connecting to all these uh, the normal uses of the consumer. So, so for example, we are connected to convenience stores, to all the banks, to all the the, the this, all these kind of stores, pharmacies. So, what we are trying to do is we are trying to build uh, better opportunities for these uh, consumers by building a credit history based on transactions. We think that uh, at the end, this low end of the market will have a better chance to, to get uh, better opportunities, economically speaking, if we can help them create a credit history. And since they don't have a bank account, they, I, I, would, I would argue that they don't have the ability to prove that they have all these uh, their income and their their transactionality. So we provide the account, and this account, based on transactions, we can we can uh, assume what is their total income and their savings if they have some savings, and what is their their expenses on on different items. And by doing this, we are providing the transaction the, the credit history by transactions. We we have found that uh, over different markets, uh, this uh, segment of the population has the same problems. Uh, the only difference will be the, uh, the currency and will be the language. But at the end, this is the same problem. They are all stuck on that vicious cycle of mm -hmm. not being able to, to, to go to the next step. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you. So, and we'll, we'll come back and, and talk a bit more about the different geographic uh, markets that are served here. So we have Air Fox in Brazil, um, Armando's uh, serving customers in, in Mexico, in the US, and in Hong Kong. So I was having a conversation over a glass of wine last night, like, how did you get from Mexico to Hong Kong? But, but as you said, the, the, there are the, the, very this, many of the same needs uh, that you can address in, in those markets. So um, now John's organization, although I think John personally doesn't live in Chicago, but his organization, Financial Health Network, is actually headquartered here in, in Chicago. And why don't you tell us a little bit about Financial Health Network so people are aware of, of what, what you do and then maybe um, how, what you've experienced with the companies you work with on this issue of corporate responsibility and so forth. Uh, I thank you for uh, positioning, I think, in the questions, both a mix of responsibility and opportunity uh, yeah. and asking it in that order. I appreciate it. Uh, Financial Health Network, formerly known as the Center for Financial Services Innovation, or CFSI, was built here in Chicago as a spinoff from uh, ShoreBank, um, focused on understanding the challenges and opportunities of the un and underbanked consumer from your framing. Um, at, the, at the start of the conversation. We're a nonprofit, national nonprofit, and principally focused on the United States with a private sector orientation. So uh, interesting to see your Pierre video. We are an investee of Omidyar, and it's interesting to work with them and others um, on private sector orientation toward improving consumer outcomes. That's the mission of our organization, to improve financial health for all. We believe that happens principally and most effectively through the private sector uh, and their delivery. Um, and in, in both of the ways that you talked about your businesses, about creating access, um, one of the things that I think in the United States, we have uh, a more significant issue around outcomes than we do around access. You know, at the core, the thesis around financial inclusion is if we create access for people to come into the financial system and drive usage, yeah. that on balance, everything else is going to turn out fine. 
Um, but in the United States, I think we've understand, especially post crisis. And, and, and is that sort of potentially an evolution that you'll see in other economies too? Because once you solve access, then maybe you still have outcomes to deal with. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're getting exactly to where yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm headed. In the United States, I think we see a stronger um, issue principally around outcomes. Post-crisis, yeah. through the crisis, we've got plenty of very well-banked people who are struggling yeah. um, financially. I'll say a bit more about that. And then we begin to hear in our work um, from the global financial inclusion space the idea that, okay, once we've created some access, that's happening. Mm -hmm. Once we've created usage, that's happening. Um, I thought your idea of facilitating access to a broader set of services through a credit uh, mechanism is a powerful one. Um, to what end for um, the consumer? Simply having access to the system um, is an insufficient way to both think and plan. Um, two other things I think I want to mention just in the, in the setup. One of the there's a lot of different things that our nonprofit does from research to consulting to investing, et cetera. But, but one of the primary things I think for this conversation is we have built and are trying to propagate in this country and around the world a, a quantifiable measurement system for financial health. So we define financial health as coming about when someone's daily system is working well. They have the ability to be resilient in the face of up and downs and they're able to pursue opportunity. And we've been able to quantify that through a mix of, of research and in-market testing um, across eight indicators of spending, saving, borrowing, and planning. Not shocking to all of us in our, in our personal lives, those things are all tightly interconnected. Mm. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think we really need to uh, think about with respect to our responsibility as payment professionals is how the things that we are doing can affect more than just the ability to buy stuff. Um, lots more I want to talk about here, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think the the last thing I'll say with respect to your question is we think that investing in and improving financial health can be a leading indicator to other KPIs, including profitability. They're connected. Okay, well, excellent. So you can see we've got kind of great great group of panelists. So I'm, I'm going to come back to uh, to Justin to talk a little bit specifically about. Brazil, and you did some of that in your opening, uh, your, your response to the first question, but maybe go into that a little bit more. And something that came to mind as, as John was talking is how much is um, education and sort of financial literacy uh, a part of the issue? And as you're rolling out your services at Airfox, how have you uh, marketed those and how have you made people aware of how your solutions can help to, to solve their issues? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a great question. Okay. So, um, you know, a, a few of the more interesting uh, uh, challenges I'll, I'll, I'll talk through. Um, you know, the, ultimately, whenever you're launching a consumer product, especially in financial services, um, uh, in emerging markets, let's say, um, the first order problems really are overcoming the inertia of the status quo and general skepticism, right? Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, um, if you think about it, you know, there's, uh, you know, I think it's close to 40% of the GDP is, is part of the informal economy. And uh, that primarily means that you know it's cash-based economy, invisible economy, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so, you know, uh, if if you're used to doing something a certain way, right, using cash, or if you've tried out banks and you got burned by them because you know you got hit with a lot of different hidden fees, uh, it's unintuitive in terms of the pricing structures for for financial products and so forth. Uh, you're generally skeptical of of promotions, of someone else telling you, hey, there's a better way around all of this. And so, when you're offering a mobile-first solution for a mobile digital bank. Um, like, like we're doing at Airfox, um, you have to get over that first order problems. And so one thing that we've done um, is we, we've closed a, a really big partnership with one of the largest retailers in Brazil. Uh, it's called Via Varejo, uh, through their stores called Casas Bea. And they have 50 million customers nationwide, almost 1,000 stores nationwide. They're a trusted consumer brand. A lot of people, um, they're, they're the one of the first to extend credit for, um, for you know, purchase financing for furniture, electronics, and so forth. So they've been around for decades. Um, and so you know, going to market with them is really a key piece of overcoming that, that initial hurdle of skepticism, of mistrust in general, um, sort of you know, inertia of the status quo, if you will. Right. Um, and so, you know, when you when you talk about a cash economy, you're really talking about performing manual transactions at physical locations, like like I mentioned earlier. Um, you're also, you know, if you combine that with a low savings rate, um, you're really talking about a population also that is primarily paycheck to paycheck, which means they're at risk for what I refer to as micro black swan events. So, you know, you could run into a, 
uh, a flat, anything from a flat tire to your, one of your kids having to go to hospital and you need emergency access to liquidity. And so formal sources of liquidity might include things like overdraft or loans or uh, even resorting to pawn shops. And so, and this is very common. Um, and so one thing we've really done to tackle these, these problems is of course, um, you know, offer, uh, well, one of, one of our partnerships with MasterCard, for example, to provide uh, free prepaid debit cards to users and perform a whole host of in-app purchases to engage in e-commerce um, and a digital savings account and access to insurance through our partner, uh, Zurich uh, Insurance, which is another large provider in, in yeah. Brazil. Um, we've also partnered with Cielo, which is one of the largest uh, payment processors in Brazil, so that they can accept payments from, from our app at uh, hundreds of thousands of merchants nationwide. So right. the general idea is, is ubiquity and seamless accessibility to these services and creating a product that people love to use. Um, and so, um, and lastly, in Brazil, um, specifically, they have a uh, negative only credit bureau. Um, and this creates kind of, a, you know, not really the, the, the clearest view of an individual's kind of formal credit history. And, mm. and also when you, when you factor in that, you know, again, I think it's 60 to 70 percent are underbanked in Brazil. This really translates to tens of millions of people um, who don't have, or I should say that have either a thin file or no file when it comes to, you know, credit histories. It's very difficult to um, to determine the risk of these of these individuals right. when they're applying for credit, and so that's why we're um, like our credit model, for example, that we're building with Zest Finance um, is essentially a machine learning based credit model which uh, utilizes thousands of signals from alternative data sets um, that banks don't have access to. This could be you know anything from uh, data from your smartphone, uh, from the uh, digital uh, banking app, and then how you spend money. All these kind of factors. There's thousands right. of different points. Uh, that get fed into paint a more holistic viewpoint of the individual. So excellent. So a lot of innovative partnerships and products. <clears throat> One of the things that I thought was interesting in what you said is, but thinking about the partnership with the retailer, um, it's almost a good lesson in kind of product development or just general business. Is you know just because uh, people are not uh, banked, that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to like go to a bank and do it in a traditional way. You've integrated the services to serve those people as a part of their life, right? They go to these retailers, they go to these places, you meet them where they are, integrate services into their life, that just helps to make their life better. I think sometimes we, uh, uh, we forget to think human-centered human design when we think yeah. about products and that's a part of how you're doing it. Exactly. So, um, so now we're gonna answer the question of how you, you go from Mexico to, to Hong Kong and the US <laughs> And what differences you might see in the issues you're solving in those geographies, Armando? And uh, we talked a little bit about, about that last night. I know there's some things that they have in common, but maybe focus a little bit on some of the things that are a little different about those uh, geographies. Well, I'd, I'd like to start by by the things that are in common. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. Common. Yeah. So, so basically, every every economy, even this great country, has a uh, non-bank and underbank segments. Mm. And, and the biggest challenge is to, to have access to, the, uh, to banking services, which, which is a, a requirement regardless, I mean, of the country is in a certain way, every, everyone needs to have a, some kind of a bank service in order to, to, to be able to, to transact in the, in the economy. So we, we have built our platform and we are integrated from top to bottom. So we have found that uh, there is a big challenge not only for 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 underbank in I mean I would say the uh, the the citizens of the country, but even for international international businessmen or international students to have a bank account in other countries, they might be uh, very well banked in their in their domestic uh, market, but they can't have access on on other markets. So so what we have done is we have been working building partnerships with uh, civil groups, with uh, businesses, to provide those, those financial services to, to their employees or to, to their members. So for them to be able to transact whenever they are traveling or whenever they are on the international arena. And, and by doing this, we, we have uh, been able to, to, to find additional opportunities on those domestic markets on those particular markets. Okay. So that's basically the way that we started moving to. Yeah. And, uh, and in the case of the uh, US-Mexico corridor, uh, 
is uh, there is a lot of uh, statistics, a lot of information about all the uh, Hispanic market here in the U.S. And, uh, and we have the idea that all these uh, remittances business is, uh, is highly lucrative and is highly, uh, I don't want to say predatory, where it's, it's very expensive for the users. And, um, and, and we want to provide a, a, a different alternative for all those users to have a, a real-time payment, a real-time transfer between, between their own uh, communities and their own families, and being able to, to transact and interact more easy and, more, and, more, uh, and less expensive. Yeah, yeah. So John, um, oh, by the way, I think we have actually less time than shows on the clock, so I want to keep this on time. But um, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about some of the, the programs mm -hmm. that um, Financial Health Network um, uh, how you work with uh, U.S.-based companies, I guess, since we've covered some other geographies on this issue of financial health and wellness. And then uh, going back to that idea of measurement, um, if you can, if you happen to have any uh, things you can share with us about, you know, how do you measure find our progress and how are we doing? What are the trends? <laughs> those types of those types of things. So six yeah. hours of conversation in a couple of minutes. Well, yeah, you got um, it. You got sure. it. You got it. Um, I think <laughs> maybe a, a couple of things, both as I listen to your question yeah. and listen to both of the um, comments on uh, yeah. from my co-panelists. I think one of the things that's been attractive um, uh, in working with emerging companies in fintech is their ability to focus on a consumer problem and um, address that problem at their core, at their mission as opposed to maybe what you might emerge from a, you know, a larger, more um, established incumbent institution that's really focused on the internal KPIs of the business and solving for those kinds of things. And so you know, with the, a measurement system around financial health, what we hope to do is inject some quantifiable um, set of KPIs into a business that actually considers the consumer's outcome, not just did I sell X, did it you know, drive uh, interaction level Y, channel engagement Z, et cetera. Like we need some actual things to measure if we want to actually start to um, manage that. And if we consider, you know, maybe that there's some other outcome in business besides just profit, um, mm -hmm. you know, the impact that we're having on our customers, the employees, the communities that we right. live in, um, then perhaps we can start to value that um, particular indicator and we can start to try to figure out how we connect it to the ways that we make money. Yeah. Um, and so I think you know that idea, uh, which is a big reason why we engaged with emerging fintech, was where we could focus on the problem, not just on the stuff that I'm yeah. selling. Um, maybe two sort of pieces of, of information to leave you with um, yeah. here uh, and wrap us up. Uh, in, in terms of data and how we're doing, um, we've experienced and worked with about 87 different companies from Chase to B of A to right. Small Credit Union to Small Community Bank on the, on the process of injecting measurement systems into their businesses. Um, each of them are making progress. The most important progress they're making is awareness of this as an actual objective, frankly. What does it mean for a marketing person or a customer service person or a product person to have this kind of data and think about how it defines their success? Um, I think at a national level, um, and maybe I'll leave you just with a couple of headlines, we've got some really interesting national um, metrics about how our economy is doing. Um, the data that you cited at the front um, end, yeah. that only 28% of this country is doing well financially when measured across indicators yeah. of spending, saving, and borrowing, and planning, points to a problem that we don't really know how to define. Um, and uh, our hope is that this kind of measurement system can help us do it. We saw financial health in this country decline two percentage points um, year over year on an average, but the average doesn't matter. Half the country had a movement of more than seven and a half points on a 100-point system driven by a variety of different factors, and we need right. some way to engage with them at that level. Yeah. What can, um, what can our, or the companies that are represented in the audience, how can they engage with what you're doing? I know you have an event that'll be in my city of Atlanta in, in May called awesome. Emerge. <laughs> That, that's a, a great opportunity, but, but uh, just maybe a little bit on how you can engage with Financial Health Network. It's really easy. Mm -hmm. Given that we're a nonprofit and are interested more in the mission than sort of selling our stuff, mm -hmm. 
everything that we're doing is open source. So this is the whole measurement system, the, uh, the methodology that we figured out how to do this. You can just go to the site, register for it, take it, use it. That's part of the point. Um, there is also uh, a network of roughly 170 organizations who have made some commitment in this way. That's um, open for business and ready to join right off the website or you can find my information here. Okay. Um, and you know, I think we can each, to your story at the start, right. we can each sort of find a way to make this our own right. um, element of the way that we run our businesses. Okay. Armand, Armando, any parting shots? Someone, one thing you want everyone to take away from this, this topic, this conversation, maybe as they go back to their jobs in different payments technology companies? Yeah, uh, John was uh, making a, a very interesting point about the, the difference between having the access and the outcome once you are there. And, uh, and I would like, I think that uh, like whenever you are in a, in, a very, uh, in a crisis or in a very complicated situation, the first thing is to, to get stabilized. And, and I think for, for this segment, for the low end segment of the, of the market, the, the stabilization means having access to, to high end services at their reasonable rate and a reasonable fee. Yeah, yeah. Justin, any parting, parting shots? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for, for anyone really in, in kind of the, the social impact space, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that you guys have also seen, you've seen the statistics, you see uh, examples of, of the things that are going on. I personally kind of view it as, you know, at, at best, some of the things that, that we see um, that are happening in the market uh, when it comes to incumbent offerings and predatory lending and stuff like that. It's just intolerable and like at worst kind of almost atrocious. And so for, for us, you know, we really have the view of like, you know, just disrupt faster, keep innovating faster, scale faster and disrupt faster. So. Okay. So Justin, John, Armando, please join me in thanking our great panel.